This royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war. I've lived abroad most of my life and these images tend to sum up how the rest of the world views us. We're a practical bunch, but prone to letting our hair down quite spectacularly when the mood strikes. Fantasy is my chosen field, and I've long been intrigued as to what it is that makes the British so prolific when it comes to writing works of fantasy and imagination. From Puck to Potter, Alice to Aslan, Toad to Tiddywinkle. Quite simply, since whoever dreamt up Beowulf put quill to vellum, we've led the world in this field. The figures speak volumes. 16 out of the top 35 best-selling authors in any language, in any genre, are fantasy writers. And 13 of those 16 are British fantasy writers, which is quite an incredible achievement in my view. So how does a nation of bankers and boozers, toffs and football hooligans come up with what is some of the most widely read and best-loved fantasy literature? What inspires our writers to create worlds of squirrels who wear Edwardian Sunday best? or scrupulously polite bears with wide circles of stuffed toy friends, or indeed wizards who have to go to school just like the rest of us. In it, I'll be looking at the unique sense of place in Britain, a temperate island of rolling fields, of Hobbiton houses in quiet river valleys, and broad coasts that brought wave after wave of invasion, and with it came myth and legend in this melting pot of nations. I'll be looking at how towns like Oxford grew up and became centres of inspiration for our writers, I'll be talking to children's publishers and authors, the people who shape our imaginations from the start. I'll be investigating how we've commercialised our own brand of fantasy to other nations and where it will go in the future. I'll be exploring our special relationship with nature, not as food or foe, but where animals are friend and equals, not something to be feared and eaten. But I'll also be looking at the contradictions, our propensity for war and how conflict and empire have shaped many of the greats, such as Tolkien and Lewis. Our ability to combine the sublime and the ridiculous, our eccentricity coupled with our reserve. I'll be exploring our unique brand of humour and how we've added it to fantasy. And I'll be going right back to our past, when the British Isles was more myth and legend than cold fact, to Arthur and the dawn of a nation with a unique narrative. I believe that this love of literature of the high imagination says more about us than we think, that it holds the key to understanding us as a nation. When Britain seems to be breaking up politically and economically, what will remain culturally or otherwise? And will we be able to keep this edge? Indeed, what else makes us stand out, punch above our weight? What else are we quietly beating the rest of the world at? With this literary legacy, the main thing, though, is that we all love it. Or at the very least, we should be proud of it as a nation. Fantastic Britain. This happy breed of men. This little world. This precious stone set in the silver sea